about your philosophy. Do you have anything in your philosophy around either building or um, or investing that is different than me or Sam or what you've heard us talking about? That's a good question. Anything different than what you and Sam have talked about? I don't know. I think that so. I, I basically take the like investing approach of Sam. I also think that like one of the things that I've done, which maybe I, I think you did as well, you build the podcast in this way, but I don't see enough people doing is a lot of people think that they either need to binar- go binary in the sense of like, I need to quit my job and build something or I need to just like do my job and, and you know one day I'll build a company. I actually think that the hybrid approach is possibly the best approach because you have the complete financial stability through your job, right? And and so you don't need to worry about that, which means you can go and be really risky, really creative and really authentic with anything that you build on the side because you're not worried about like, oh, how do I convert these people today? Or how do I make sure I have dinner on the table? And so that's what I don't see enough creators doing. They think they need to go like full Zuckerberg, drop out of school and, you know, scale a business right away. And when I see a lot of indie hackers that do that, they burn out real quick because they're like, this isn't even fun anymore. And (laughs) I also like, I thought I could make money in three months and I can't. So I think maybe that's not different to what you and Sam have done, but I think that's different to what I see a lot of creators do. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Yeah, I actually think on that, like, I think in general, it's better not to take hybrid approaches because hybrid approaches are typically um, like kind of compromises or have your cake and eat it twos that you're trying to get. And like, if you just really said what you wanted, the, the question is, are you doing the hybrid approach because you want to do both things or are you doing the hybrid approach because you're afraid the thing you want to do won't work or because you're, you know, basically fear, right? You have some doubt about the, the thing. And, um, and I've definitely done both. So like the podcast I definitely did while I was, was at Twitch. Um, and then I'd since quit Twitch and do it now more or less, you know, f- full on. Um, so I have done that, but w- it, it depends. I think you could do it with hobbies and I consider investing a hobby. I consider podcasting a hobby. I don't think you can do it with company building in the same, so the same, like I wouldn't advise it for that. For your company building, it's like, look, you, if this works, the prize is big. In order for this to work, the commitment is full on. You should just go full on with it once you have, once you have conviction and like for everybody, conviction comes at a different level, but um, I'm the type that's sort of like, you know, just default to conviction quickly and then change my mind once I have evidence that it's, that it's not right. Um, so I, I would say we probably do differ a little bit in that. I'm not a, I'm not a huge believer in the side hustle, even though it looks like I have tons of side hustles. I actually, um, I think the optimal path is to just know what you want and then go for it. Um, and then if you, if it doesn't work out, you can sort of always fall back to the job and things like that. America is kind of a great place in that sense where, you know, failure is, is rewarded here and unlike any other culture that I've ever seen. Um, and so because of that, you can use that to your advantage, especially in the tech industry. Like I did a failed startup is like, oh, good. That's like, you know, solid experience that you have, <laughs> you know, screwing it up. Uh, and I don't think that's true for most industries and most cultures. Yeah, I think there's a couple of examples where I think often people, I so agree with you, if you're going to go create the next like billion, trillion even, people are talking about, um, company, then I think, yes, you got to go all in, but there are tons of examples where like the Google founders, like they made sure they, they finished their PhDs before actually going all in because they wanted almost like that stability. Same thing with the Spanx founder. I think she was, I can't remember if it was her or someone else like selling printers to make sure that she had like the long-term vision in order to build Spanx. Um, but we can agree to slightly disagree on that one, (laughs) but why don't we do, why don't we do one more, uh, do do the expired patents one? Uh, let's do, hold on. Let me look at this list. I, I think there might be a better one than that. Cause I think that one we might've talked about before. Let's talk about this financial, uh, this fidelity rule change and what that might mean. So talk about the, uh, the fidelity thing that you, you had here at the bottom. Yeah. So fidelity recently launched trading accounts for 13 to 17 year olds. So before I, I'm not sure if they just didn't have them or if it was illegal, I'm not sure you've talked about how rule changes are game changers and they unlock innovation. So um, basically now teens can open accounts. They do need to, I, I believe that they actually need to have like a parent open the account for them. But basically there's this new wave of investors. We've seen the same thing with Robinhood that are able to trade, able to make deposits, able to, um, you know, buy ETFs, all of, all of those things. And so I think that, you know, you have this new huge cohort of people and that'll continue to be true. Someone needs to create some sort of financial education game for these children um, because the parents are going to 
be way more likely a to allow their children to go, you know, trade these stocks if right. if they've had that. But also, I think you can make it fun, right? Like we've talked before about how education is really boring <laughs> most of the time, and so I think like TikTok generation, someone go create a financial education game for these kids. Yeah, there was an idea that uh, on the episode we did with Elaine, she said that has stuck with me. She goes, "Why isn't there fantasy sports for trading, and um, or fantasy football for for trading, basically?" And I was like, that's kind of a great idea. And, and this, this sort of reminds me of that trend, which is there's, there's already like, you know, Robin Hood kind of like captured this opportunity that was kind of hidden in plain sight, which was that more people would trade if you lowered the friction, right? Put it on their phone, make it no fees for, for every trade and make the UI simpler where you can just like, you know, see pretty charts and push buttons and, and they would give you a free, you know, share of Apple or share of Tesla or whatever at the time when you signed up, if you referred friends and, and all that good stuff. So they, they kind of Gen Z did up and, and did a good job there. But, um, and then there, now there's this whole wave of like every version of stock trading app. It's like a stock trading app, social network, a stock trading app. That's like super hardcore for options traders. And I actually think somebody should go into the other quadrant of the, of the chart, which is basically like, you're not doing it to get rich. You're doing it for fun. And what does that mean? And I think the fantasy trading game is kind of interesting here where if I could do this with like, let's say if I had a teenager and it's something that a teenager could do with their friends or with their parents or their family and everybody creates almost like daily fantasy, you basically create a monthly um, stock game. And the way it works is everybody gets the same budget and, um, and then you get to allocate that into different stocks and everybody sees what everybody invested in and then it sort of plays out over the course of the month and every day there's like trading news. So there's kind of like, ups and downs as you go there. And then you basically create some kind of fantasy sports game around the stock market. And I think if you did that, you could definitely, like fantasy sports, I think there's like 50 million plus players of it. Um, I think that you could create a, a fantasy version of trading that may not have 50 million, but I think you can get into the millions of people who are participating in this. And uh, that would be very valuable. Those leads would be very valuable because you could upsell them into actually trading because they're going to have seen their fantasy portfolio crush it. And they're going to think, oh my God, I should go play the real game. Um, so those leads are extremely valuable, whether you build it yourself or you sell it off to Robinhood or whoever else, you partner with them. Um, or you could even have like a premium version of this where it's like, oh, pay extra and you get, you get, you know, whatever, some advanced uh, like charts, metrics, like saved, we save your history, whatever it is. So what do you think of this fantasy sports idea for the stock market? No, I love it because as I said, I think a lot of the time people try to acquire users, like, you know, let me just like do this promo or something. And really the, the easiest way to acquire users is to make something fun, right? So you would acquire all these users through this game and the beauty of acquiring, you know, maybe some people would think this is a little predatory, but acquiring users from 13 to 17 is that in five years, they're going to be 18. Um, right. To First job, 20, you know. Yeah, exactly. To 22. And, and then, you know, even past that, they're just going to be scaling in net worth and you're acquiring them when they're really cheap and when it's easy to acquire them through things like a game, right? And so you don't really see many banks Steph, doing that. Like Steph the shark, I love it. The predatory <laughs> Steph comes out. No more, no more nice Steph on, on no, Twitter. I mean, this is the, the real calculating cold-blooded killer. Why do you think YouTube and <laughs> Instagram want to create versions for kids? I mean, it's so that they can acquire users easily and then kind of stick with those users for the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years. And I think, I mean, again, it's predatory. So if someone does this, please, you know, do it well and, and do it, <laughs> you know, with, with good intentions. But it, it's true that, you know, this is a rule unlock, right, where these people are, are coming online, they, they have access to these products. And if you can do it in a smart way where parents feel good about your product, unlike, you know, perhaps how parents feel about something like an Instagram for kids, then I think you're going to get a huge swath of users that will carry through with you for a long time. 